uh, we are delighted to have uh, an, a highly esteemed panel with us uh, this afternoon uh, to talk about what does progress mean in today's context and how do we know there's been some. Uh, to help us answer this question, we have three uh, brilliant colleagues. We have um, Dr. or Professor Anna Alexandrova, who is Professor in Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge and a fellow at King's College here in Cambridge. We have Professor Bina Agarwal, no relation, uh, <laughs> who's Professor of Development Economics and Environment at the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester. And we have Dr. Claire Melamed, uh, CEO of the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. Um, I'm delighted to uh, share this panel with this particular group because we have people who, with whom I am currently co-authoring research, people whose work I have read over the past decade, and people who I would like to be co-authoring work uh, in, in the next few uh, weeks and months. Um, so it's a great chance for me. Um, but without further ado, what I'd like to do is um, sort of open with my view on what gets us to this question of, of defining and measuring progress. I was trained as an economist um, and much of economics at a superficial level at least is about constrained optimization. Constrained because the resources at our disposal are scarce and optimization because we wanna do the best that we possibly can with those scarce resources. Now that worked for the first few years uh, uh, of economics for me, but fairly quickly you learn that that begs a much deeper question, which is what do we mean when we say the best we possibly can with those resources? Uh, and so to help us answer that, I'd like first to turn to Anna to share some of your experience working in this area. Um, what do you think progress means in today's context? Uh, and how do we know there's been some? Thank you, Matthew. Uh, I shall start as a philosopher and I make no apologies. So uh, progress is what in philosophy we call a thick concept, thick. Uh, a thick concept is a concept that both describes and evaluates. And that means a good indicator of progress for a community is a pithy summary of those values that the community would like to be described by. And figuring out what that pithy summary is means solving a dilemma. The dilemma on the one hand between um, the richness and the variety of values the community will inevitably have, um, both at a time and over time. And on the other hand, having a practical indicator that is measurable, that produces a quantity that is simple enough to handle and that can be used to track change. So all of the examples of progress indicators that we see both historically and today are different solutions as I see to this fundamental dilemma. And uh, often enough, I think we should consider the option that perhaps that dilemma will just cannot be sort of, uh, addressed. Uh, let me just say how um, you, we've, still, we've heard a lot today about the uh, economic indicators of progress, such as uh, growth, uh, gross domestic product, et cetera. So it's not that advocates of this, um, of these indicators think that you know, economic value is the only value there is. No, that's, that's, that's just not charitable enough. Rather, the bet is that if we describe the economic activity richly and thoroughly enough, it will be a decent indicator and a decent correlate of the values of the community. But I think it is even this bet that has, become, has come under uh, uh, pressure and the pressure because um, you know, we, we, uh, we, we just don't see it reflect human flourishing, uh, sustainability, ideals of equality, and others. Uh, so here at the Bennett Institute, uh, together with uh, 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 colleagues such as Mark Fabian here uh, in the audience, a great pioneer of, um, 
participatory approaches to well being, we've been thinking about whether well being is potentially such a replacement, uh, the one that would be able to strike the right balance between richness on the one hand and uh, practicality on the other. And what we find is that, again, uh, not necessarily. <laughs> it depends entirely on um, how uh, seriously you come to formulating uh, the, your vision of well-being, your, your concept, what, in, what it encompasses. And it depends entirely on also, uh, you know, whether you plug it into a, a good decision-making process, a decision-making process that in particular doesn't just chase the indicators and doesn't just, you know, mechanically evaluate a policy on the basis of whether or not it has raised uh, an indicator like of, the, I don't have answers to you. I mean, I have lots and lots of opinions and lots of things that we have found, but uh, I guess ultimately that's probably a good time for me to end. The, uh, we, we are hoping to, um, to, to find a way of thinking about well-being indicators that um, doesn't just replicate old models of thinking that you know, we need a number that we that that our policies need to change. There are lots of problems with this idea. Uh, earlier in this, uh, in in one of the panels, Fiona Reynolds mentioned that perhaps what counts as progress will depend on, uh, you know, will be different in different places. Uh, imagine the challenge of that. I, a sentiment that I agree with strongly. Uh, what happens to national numbers? What does the Office of National Statistics? collect, start collecting, and what should we be reporting, and whether it's okay to, you know, change an indicator as a community changes, will it be able to track uh, um, uh, progress? Um, th these are probably very, you know, negative and big questions to end with, but it's suitable things for Things I think we can, we can jump yeah. in on in, in, in questions and through the rest of the discussion, but thank you very much, Anna. Um, Bina. You have right. a different perspective, a different experience. Uh, yes, so um, we're putting on different hats. Uh, my, my hat as an economist, but also somebody who's dabbled in public policy. So, um, uh, so Anna's position would take us to multiple indicators and participatory uh, discussion with communities would also lead to multiple indicators and perhaps no consensus because there are indicators that just fall through the cracks. So, um, and measurement has cost, constrained optimization. So I think we need to choose indicators of progress. Um, um, and where, what should we choose? Um, I believe we should choose those which have the most synergy with other indicators. And we also need to recognize the limits of public policy. So in this uh, respect, uh, I'm going to take a jump and uh, say that for me, progress, uh, the key indicator is reduction of inequalities but not just any inequalities, particularly a reduction of gender inequality and wealth. Why? Because I think there's substantial evidence, and I'll take you to the Global South now, from developing countries that closing the gender gap um, in private wealth would make the most important difference to the most people, women, their families, and a country's growth. And it's been found, for instance, uh, that when women own assets, it reduces theirs and their children's risk of poverty. It improves child survival, health, and education much more than if the father owns assets. It reduces the risk of domestic violence. It improves food security in households and communities. So reducing the gender gap in wealth would directly help us achieve not just SDG 5 on gender, but also SDGs on poverty, on hunger, and overall inequality, and indirectly many other SDGs. So these are what we might say positive externalities, which go much beyond household level wealth inequality. But there is very limited data in wealth globally, you know, gender gaps in wealth globally, uh, especially if you take something as important as immovable property like land. So if you look at the FAO's database, um, gender disaggregated data on land covers only 20 countries, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa. If you analyze that existing data, you find high inequalities. So um, suppose you were to ask what percent of landowners are women? 
The average is 22% for nine countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, 11 to 27% in five countries in Latin America, and 11, 14 to 22% for two countries in South Asia. Now, public policy has focused mainly on uh, the legal framework, such as equality and inheritance laws. But these persisting inequalities suggest that there are serious limits to public policy. So I'll just give you one somewhat dramatic example from India, that in 2005, I led a camp civil society campaign to amend the Hindu inheritance law, and we were successful. The law is gender equal. Yet when I very recently analyzed a very rare data set uh, for nine states across India, in 2014, guess what would be the uh, measure of uh, what percent of women land, uh, are landowners? Only 14% of all landowners are women, owning only 11% of land. So we need to ask what obstructs public policy and it takes us to other kinds of measures. I would say disabling social norms and the low social uh, you know, uh, legitimacy of women's claims. Now social norms are not social capital. I want to mention it because uh, we economists have now uh, caught hold of social capital and believe it can explain a lot of stuff. It can, but with limits. And then one needs to ask which social norms matter. So you, you go into the realm of anthropology and sociology, marriage norms matter, who you marry and postmarital residence. So in South Asia, parents are very resistant to endowing daughters in land with land in regions where social norms dictate that they should marry strangers for incest reasons and at long distances from their uh, birth villages. They are much less resistant where you allow within kin marriage and in the village. So how do, we, uh, how do we circumvent these obstacles? I think public policy needs to move beyond legal enactments to other policy instruments, none of which are very easy, you know, are, are perfect. Direct transfers of land to poor women, subsidies for improving poor women's market access to land, markets work as a, can work as an equalizer sometimes. Um, tax incentives for families, and what's very interesting is that delivering how these policies matters. So if you actually deliver it to groups rather than to individuals, it can make a much more effective, uh, lead to a much more effective result. So I rest with that. I promised you she would have a different perspective. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Bina. Claire, it's gonna be the same question. Um, what do you think progress means in today's context? Thank you, Matthew. Um, and I know it's become a complete cliche, but I have to say it, it's just so thrilling to be here with an actual audience and apologies to everyone who's watching online. I hope you get to go to something quite soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thinking, so in my day job at the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, we work with governments and so we're very focused on working with governments to develop the data systems which underpin public policy so very relevant to the I mean I'm kind of the link I think between the previous panel and this one um, and thinking about where does that data and evidence come from which is then used to inform the kinds of crisis decisions that we were talking about last time and in that context obviously I think you know I'm very aware in the sort of day-to-day -day of that role how developing a sort of building and particularly you know making choices around where investment goes where risks are taken in terms of innovation and what are some of the trade-offs about the interplay between the kind of technical requirements of data and all of the uh, methodologies and sort of rules that have been laid down by statisticians over the years and the politics of data and we often think about data as something which is kind of dropped from the sky in perfect form and so there are you know we sort of the the choices that are made about how data is constructed what is collected what we see as data are often quite invisible and i think you know people are sort of tend to be a bit frightened of numbers and sort of see them as something that doesn't really have to do with them but i think you know my work makes me very aware of the politics of data and of course you know that goes double in a sense for the politics of data that is used to measure progress because progress and the idea of progress and governments being able to deliver progress is so central to democracy and that is so central to the sort of political platforms on which governments stand so they're 
interest in being able to show that that is happening and ideally that they that has something to do with their policies is very very high so the whole sort of concept of of data on progress is one of the more political ends of data I mean, I think a few things to say really about sort of where are some of those political decision points and how do they influence how we define data, how we measure data. Um, I mean, I think first of all, of course, and this really comes very much directly from what Bina was saying, in data, the data that we have reflects existing relationship, power relationships within a society. So what are we not measuring? We're not measuring things that primarily affect women. In most countries, the data on domestic violence is appalling. So, you know, we're, we're, the things that we measure reflect, by and large, the things which people who have power, who control resources, think are important. Um, and that goes true everywhere, I think. You know, the gender data is, you know, the, the kinds of um, data on the things which primarily affect women and data which allows you to talk about the differences between the experiences of men and women, uh, you know, tend to be historically very underfunded, under-researched and so on. What I think is what I'm also very encouraged by at the moment, though, is in, in my network, um, the ways in which many groups who sort of, you know, who bring together groups of people who are, feel themselves to be powerless and are sort of seeking to increase their power are increasingly using data as a tool for advocacy. One of the, the most sort of electrifying moments um, of, of the last year for me was a, a conversation that I was privileged to listen into um, with uh, a woman called Gwen Phillips, who is a member of a First Nations group in Canada, who have been really sort of you, really spearheading in a way a group of um, a network of indigenous people who've been really thinking about how data, how they can be better represented in the data which tells the story of the societies in which they live. And her complaint was that she, she used a word ugly, which I think really interesting. She said, don't use the, the data that you collect, she said, just just tells me how ugly I am. And it doesn't tell, you know, the data that you're collecting to tell the story of this society doesn't say anything positive. It doesn't, it doesn't tell you about the assets that my community holds. It doesn't tell you about, uh, you know, the, the things that we're getting right, the things that are going well for us. It just constantly sort of tells a litany of bad stuff and all the terrible things that are happening in, you know, in my community. And I think, you know, this idea of agency of people, if data has power, thinking harder about the power relationships that are involved in creating, collecting data, and then thinking about, you know, if you want, and this is links very much directly to, to Anna's point as well, data is a, what, what just, as in any, just as any other sort of democratic process, what the outcome has to be the product of sort of contestation between different communities over what's important. And we have to, I think, make that more visible and sort of make those power relationships and choices, the very deliberate choices that are made more transparent. If we want to make sure that the data that we're collecting, the data that's being used to tell the story of progress is actually reflecting the kind of whole picture of progress in a society. So I think, I mean, I hope to say more later on, but just, you know, it's probably enough for now, the sort of just making very visible the power relationships which underpin what appear as fairly sort of technical, straightforward, uncontestable things. I think we would all be helping ourselves to make that data more useful in creating progress if we were more open and transparent about the process that we were using to collect it in the first place and some of the choices that we're making. That's a, a long running interest at the Bennett, is that, <laughs> um, especially through some of Diane's work. Um, so we will come back to you on power dynamics and data collection. Uh, in a bit. But um, the devil is always in the details, isn't it, Anna? Um, I'm, I'm wondering if what you could do is um, give us a brief overview of some of the key existing progress indicators mm -hmm. and what might be their relative strengths and weaknesses. Thank you. Well, I think that's very much following up on uh, Bina and Claire's remarks. So imagine a, a question um, and the depending on what answer to, you, to that question you give, you'll choose a different uh, indicator. If you ask people, how are you doing, all things considered, do you assume that in answering this question, 
people have considered all of the things that matter to them, <laughs> aggregated it in a, in a, in a, um, a single <laughs> value, and then spit out that value to you in the survey. If you think that that's what happens, you will uh, go with uh, um, a survey, a survey of uh, subjective evaluations. If you don't think that's what happens, you will go with uh, the dashboard, uh, as, as I think Dino has already mentioned. The dashboard is uh, <laughs> a very difficult thing to put together. Um, do you put uh, the inequalities in it first and foremost? Do you put um, uh, actual access or relative access uh, to, to goods and what goods at all? Um, but I, so, you know, on the one hand, then, you know, if you go with a survey, you will find indicators of progress um, uh, that are currently becoming more popular in the UK, uh, such as life satisfaction. And on the other hand, you will, ha you will have, there are so many dashboards, that's the difficulty, right? Um, there is the uh, sustainable development goals that Mina, Bina has uh, mentioned. Um, uh, there are more theoretical approaches, such as the capabilities approach. There is the genuine progress indicator. There are all the kinds of capital that uh, Matthew works on. So uh, even if you, you know, even if you decide, okay, I'm going to go with the dashboard, your only your work only just begins uh, what what to go in the dashboard. Um, but I will say that, um, you know, dashboard is in the end our only option. And that is because um, the reason why people don't like dashboard, and that's usually economists, is because it doesn't yield a single indicator at the end. But uh, that is kind of their problem. <laughs> um. But well, luckily, as chair, I don't have to respond. I can just move. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can. So, uh, all right. So there's a range of indicators then, um, which brings me to the next question. I've been, do you think we need more measures? Why do we need these measures? Should we have more? Should we have fewer? Um, in my view, I think I've partly answered it in my intervention. Uh, that you, uh, you need fewer, uh, but we need to then do much more work. We shouldn't just lay out and say, take what you want, but we also need to have some guidance for public policy to say, well, A affects B, B affects C, whereas D is just an outlier. So let's, let's look at, is A has the most synergy with B and C and pick that. Now, I think that's where the um, academic and other expertise uh, comes in to guide public policy. Um, so I, I'll, I'll keep it brief and then. <laughs> Perfect. And um, Claire, I wanted to ask you because we've discussed previously about um, the problem with a lot of uh, the economic measurement world is that we, we operate under this assumption that if we build it, they will come. Um, and that that might not be entirely accurate. Uh, I mean, I think this links to to the last um, question and Bina's answer, you know, do we have enough? What do we need? The question is, I think, kind of enough indicators for what? What is it we need this data for? And how can we make sure that the data that we're collecting is right for the purpose that we're collecting it? Um, I mean, I think the, you know, the build it and they will come mentality is very um certainly very uh, rife in, in the world that I inhabit of, you know, people who are sort of trying to, you know, believe very strongly in the potential of data to inform progress, to drive progress, to be the kind of evidence base for progress, the frustration that sometimes this isn't happening. And the response is always, but if we just throw more and more data at it, eventually some of it will stick. And if we just create another dashboard and another way to present this, and maybe we change the font a bit and all oh, let's change the color scheme, <laughs> suddenly everybody will realize that this is incredibly fantastic data and we'll start using it. And of course that is never the answer. Yeah. And the reasons why people are not using the data on the whole is not because they don't know it exists or, or because, uh, or, you know, because they somehow aren't accessing it, but because they're it's not in the culture, it's the institutional frameworks are against them, the resourcing is such that, you know, it's too difficult, there are lots of reasons, but they're, um, they're very rarely solved by a new dashboard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think, 
yeah, I mean, I think it just again comes comes back to the politics of it. You know, what are the incentives that we create for using data? How do we build the sort of use of data and information and the collection of data and information into um, into the incentives uh, frameworks that we create for leaders at different levels in different institutions? I think. Right. So it's it's a question of oh, sorry, Bina. Yeah, uh, please. Uh, just wanted to go. So, um, and so it's adding on. Uh, I, I think uh, um, economists are actually responsible for a lot of ill. They can be responsible for a lot of good as well. Uh, and uh, we need what kind of data do we collect? We go back to your that point, uh, uh, Claire. Um, so. Um, it, the, it, so it depends on what economic theoretical model we're following. And I'll give you an example from why is it that it took us so long to recognize intra-household inequalities? So we had the Beckerian model, um, which uh, with, with its assumptions that you know families are like glued together families, Amartya Sen calls the glued together families, uh, where it's assumed that the household head, male household head is an altruist and uh, represents the household's uh, objective functions. And we all have, uh, all the household members have the same interests. Um, now, huge amounts of empirical evidence emerge from, not necessarily from economists, from anthropology and sociology to say there's huge inequalities in the household uh, in terms of education, health outcomes, you know, uh, food uh, distribution and so on. So we need an alternative model. Well, the good thing about economists is they sometimes rethink. <laughs> and, and so you had the emergence of bargaining models of the household, which said that what's going on in households is a dissimilar, not that dissimilar to markets that you have both self-interest and altruism prevailing in households, that households are not just heart of the heartless world, but there's also a lot of self-interest there. And the moment you begin to recognize that there are, in, that there are different, uh, de, um, uh, that people have different preferences by gender, by age, the, and, and they have uh, different interests, um, and then you begin to, you know, you begin to pay attention to data and then you actually gather that data. And that has a direct link to public policy. So Beckerian model will say, well, let's just give everything to male head of household, uh, you know, as it happened in terms of land reform across the globe in the 1960s. When you recognize the bargaining model as the correct model, you begin to see that it changes the power imbalance in the household. And you begin to transfer resources to the, um, uh, to the uh, more vulnerable members, i.e let's say women or younger women. Um, and that makes a dramatic difference. Now, today we do see public policy. Take Brazil, which started transferring, uh, made direct transfers, not to the male head of household, but to the, to the woman head of household. And, and under COVID also, you see that. So I feel that uh, economic theory linked with the kind of data you collect um, is then linked with uh, improvement in public policy. That's a very interesting um, perspective. It, it le leads me directly to the next question. We've spoken about power dynamics now within the household, but um, Claire, you mentioned the role that power plays uh, in driving definitions and measurements of progress. I'm wondering if you uh, could elaborate a bit on yeah, this. No, absolutely. And I think this sort of follows on very nicely from, um, from Bina's point as well. And the sort of one of the I had a bit of a ringside seat over sort of between about 2014 and, and the end of 2015 and the sort of political process around negotiating the sustainable development goals and then particularly negotiating because it was effectively a political negotiation, the indicator framework that was then used to monitor those goals. And I think, you know, this I think really illustrates the sort of political reality of this two-stage process. So obviously the inclusion of the environmental goals within the sustainable development goals was a big shift in the sort of global consensus around the definition of progress from a millennium development goals framework, which was entirely framed around sort of human progress in health and education, income and so on, to, you know, the sustainable development goals progress, which also included um, elements of resource use, um, natural resources, uh, biodiversity and so on. And that was a huge and really, really significant shift. The, um, when that went into the indicator framework, of course, that shift then had they, the, there had to be then a sort of negotiated agreement between statisticians about 
what were the global indicators that were going to be used to measure that? And I think, you know, this speaks very much to this point about what do you want the data for? If you want data to reflect the reality of a specific community, you can be quite creative in your use of indicators and thoughtful about adapting them to the context. If you want indicators which are going to be globally comparable, well, then, you know, the trade-offs become more acute and, and you know, you necessarily lose uh, quite a lot of that context. But one of the one of the arguments, uh, and this is this is a glimpse into the UN that perhaps nobody really wants to see, but um, was about the definition of what is a tree. <laughs> now, this is not as simple as you think, because uh, if you have an indicator of deforestation, then clearly what you need to know is what is a what is the definition of a forest and what is the definition of what's the you know what do you call a tree that makes up a forest if you put a load of house plants out in your garden is that a forest obviously not if you go walking in the redwood forests of california that very obviously is all those very obviously are trees somewhere in the middle of that is the boundary between a plant and a tree and that really really matters if you're trying to if all governments are going to have to are going to have to um are going to have to report on their progress on deforestation and one of the big things that was contested was whether a coffee plant is a tree. Because clearly, if you are a country that exports coffee and what you want to do is to cut down forests and plant coffee plantations, it suits you enormously if those coffee plantations are counted as forests. And that will help you a lot in showing your progress on the on the uh, showing that, you know, you're able to meet your economic goals and your uh, and, and improve your trade balance without having to sacrifice your environment. If a coffee plant is not a tree, then you have much harder job explaining to the international community why you're, you know, why you're making the choices that you're making. So, um, you know, this was eventually they reached some compromise about height and size, and it's all very, uh, it's all very technical. But I think it shows the sort of complexity of even once you, even once you reach the sort of hard fought negotiated agreement about what progress is and what's important, you then have to have another set of arguments that are equally political about how you measure it. That's, uh, so we, we, we've heard now about power dynamics and progress in the household and across countries at, at uh, the intergovernmental level. And uh, our work, uh, your work, has um, increasing uh, influence in government. Um, the work on subjective well-being, the work on how we might measure uh, uh, well-being and progress is a hot topic. It's one of the missions in the leveling up white paper, but there are some power dynamics there as well, between the, but largely among the expert community. And I wondered if you might be willing to share some of your thoughts. Mm. Thank you. So we are ending at a certain kind of ending up at a certain pluralism, the idea that, you know, depending what the progress indicator, what work you want the progress indicator to uh, do, you will have different demands on it. Uh, international comparisons will, uh, will, will dictate uh, uh, one feature of indicators, uh, figuring out um, the kind of the actual empirical strength of the indicator to pick out the most prob problematic areas, like Bina described, uh, will lead you to another. Um, I, I've been thinking about what sort of indicator um, works at a, at a pretty small um, level. Like if a community such as, uh, you know, a charity or a city decides to uh, judge themselves um, uh, by, um, say, their uh, uh, ability to promote thriving, which is uh, um, one of the, the uh, one of the goals that was brought to us by a very important uh, UK charity turned to us, uh, who asked Mark and I to help them develop um, um, an indicator of thriving. So speaking of expertise, the most important uh, um, feature of, of that exercise that I'm very proud of uh, for participating is the fact that we recognize different kinds of expertise uh, about uh, thriving. Expertise can be uh, academic about what theories underlie and how measures work. Expertise can be practical, such as, um, you know, who is 
who do you administer a questionnaire to? Do you want to administer a questionnaire to a person in crisis? Is that only going to um, alienate them, make them feel like a number? And finally, expertise can be just kind of completely on the other side, lived expertise about what it's like to uh, thrive in, in an adversity. If there is any um, recipe for a good progress indicator, whether it's international level or um, any other, we have learned that it has to be um, a compromise between at least three of these different kinds of expertise. And it should never be the case that an expert says, I have pre-validated an indicator for you. Go ahead and use it. I have been to countless sessions like that where um, colleagues uh, you know, try to sort of sell their work to charities by saying, don't worry, you don't need to do your own search. You know, you, I have pre-validated things. Go ahead and use it. It's expert vetted. That's not how validation works. There are different kinds of expertise. Yeah, that all this is a very exciting project that we have. If you go to the Bennett website and look for our work uh, with Turn <laughs> to Us, you can read more. Um, we're going to come to the audience for questions, but uh, as the chair, I get to break the rules. And I'm going to come back to Bina for one last question, uh, because it relates to the project that I run uh, called the Wealth Economy Project. Um, much of what we've spoken about or is about um, inequalities in individual wealth. Uh, but you've also done considerable work on inequalities in public wealth. And so I was hoping you might share some of your thoughts on how the distribution of public wealth drives your view okay. of progress. Um, I'm happy to do that. And I'll slightly break the rule and come back to a small comment of what Anna said at the end of my intervention, if that's OK. Um, so, um, so you have private wealth, and it's of course it's it's always a continuum of wealth. Uh, but let's say we can talk about public wealth. Uh, what typically public wealth does, in a way, is smooth out the inequalities in private wealth. So, so for instance, you don't have a private garden. You you walk out of your door and you come right into the street where 15 cars parked, um, and you say, well, okay, let's go to Hyde Park, or wherever. Let's go. Cambridge has lots of green spaces. Um, <laughs> so, so if you don't have something private, you can actually get it if, if it's a commons. Um, and that's a very important role of public wealth. Um, now, uh, and that's part of natural capital that you work on, which is biodiverse for, forests and so on. Now, the important thing to remember, however, is that uh, take forests, um, which provide uh, not just carbon sequestration and the way we talk about it, but also livelihoods and essential needs for large numbers of people. So um, yeah, there was a report which I did with some Cambridge colleagues and others that we found globally one in six persons in rural societies draw upon forests for many essential items, food, fiber, firewood, um, uh, fodder, and, and, and so on. And by one estimate, among many estimates, something like 47 to 89% of the GDP of the poor, as they call it, um, it comes, from, comes from forests. But access to public wealth, like access to private wealth, can be extremely unequal. Um, so um, just as an example, in the 1990s, many Asian countries uh, launched a co-management of forests as a policy. Um, and uh, India was one of the first in 1990, which meant that communities were given degraded forest land to manage. And I traveled in 1998, 99 across India and parts of Nepal. And I said, bravo, you know, you have entire hillsides which were, uh, you could barely get a leaf if you took a broom. And now they are greening, so that's progress. But wait, uh, I met the village community and I met the women. And they said, we have nowhere to go for firewood. Men have closed off the forests. So on the one hand, yes, there's progress, very much growth of natural capital. And on the other hand, it, it's led to huge inequalities and in access to a key public for a form of public wealth. Is this progress? So do we have an answer? Well, yes, we have an answer in what something that Anna said. Let's include the excluded in our, in our processes of public wealth decision-making. So um, in some previous book called Gender and Green Governance, I actually looked at, does it make a difference if you include women? And it made a huge difference. 
not only did it lead to more equal rules of access, but it actually made a significant difference to conservation outcomes. So the point is that as in private wealth distribution, so in public dis wealth distribution, re reduction in inequality and particularly gender inequality could actually take us to a win-win. Um, I won't take more time. I did want to respond to something that Anna said, but maybe later. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Unless, Anna, did you want to respond? No. no. Okay, well, with that then, um, I will open up to the floor uh, to questions. Uh, let's start from, uh, from the left here. We have, we have a woman in, in front, and then we have Mark uh, thereafter, and who's going to be next? Uh, there's a woman in the back wearing a mask with her hand raised as well. Thank you, Andrea Westall. I, I sat here because in the, I was in the Valley of Death in the middle and nobody could see me before, so definitely can be seen. Um, so I was in, involved with writing the standard for uh, social value for British standards. Now, social value in the UK is being used to look at all the environmental, economic, social added value in procurement decisions, and it's become this thing, which is now another way of looking at multiple progress. When we wrote that standard, what was interesting was trying to get a definition, and we ended up with well-being in the short and long term. So it starts to talk to what you're saying, but equally it started to bring the SDGs in. So I think we're at a point where, where in some senses there is a relative convergence of what I think we, we mean by this. But the, 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 and then we can get into how we measure it. The bit that is, is just not being talked about, and we're still, particularly within things like ESG, environment, social governance, it's still about win-win. Oh, look, we can have it all. And I just wonder if, like you were saying, it starts questions about the interrelationships between different data, what happens. Do we need to start also thinking about trade-offs and how we might use different measures? And this really goes beyond the economists to some kind of multi-criteria decision-making approach, which enables policymakers to be totally transparent about what those decisions are, what's being used and what is being traded off. Because one can create progress in the short term, huge, but it's taking it away from the future, et cetera, et cetera. So there's more to it, I think, than having the dashboard because that could be problematic in its own way. Great, so we'll have a question on how do we identify and address the trade-offs that come. Uh, but first, can we get one from Mark? Uh, sorry, uh, it was gonna be uh, Mark Fabian, just behind me. Uh, hi, thanks for a great panel. Um, so I'm Mark Fabian. Uh, just a, a lot of the discussion in, in this whole space, I think, and also on this panel, is at, at quite a high level about global comparisons and what progress means as a society and these kind of things. And I just want to ask a question sort of from the perspective of a street level bureaucrat. So a lot of public policy is about delivering services. Like if I run a job centre, if I run a national park or a hospital or something like that, and I'm trying to measure progress and I'm trying to serve the values of my society, what sort of data do I need to think about that in the context of the, the quite nitty gritty work that I'm doing? Um, and do you guys have any insights for, for that sort of part of policy? Thank you. And then we had one question uh, in the middle, halfway back, most of the way back. Um, hi, thank you so much for, for your insights. Um, going back to the very first question about what does progress mean, I'm curious to know how you perceive the relationship between progress and growth, um, and especially sort of focusing on growth, um, moving forward as policymakers, um, you know, how can we make sure that that growth is not harmfully anthropocentric, um, especially when we consider sort of the current um, ecological and climate crisis that we're, that we're facing? Thank you. Excellent. So we... Thank you very much for these questions. We, we have three. Um, does anybody want to come in on where are the trade-offs? How do we identify and deal with them? Yeah, sure, Anna? thank you. Um, so there will always be trade-offs, even if you decide that you only are going to maximize one indicator, you will still uh, have to make all sorts of judgment calls about, um, um, yes, you know, about whether or not this indicator is, is suitable in particular situation, whether, whether or not it shows sufficient responsiveness to change. Um, so I'm not sure that uh, going with multiple um, 
indicators puts us in the worst position with regard to trade-offs because judgment calls will have to be explained either way. We will, we will have to do that. And I think the only solution here is to move away from the idea that, um, that the only way to justify a decision is going to be to show that a certain indicator has risen if the, if, and therefore the decision is correct or a certain indicator has fallen, the decision is incorrect. Now we're gonna have to uh, get, yes, uh, move away from this technocratic ideal that you know, we remove, we can remove politics and just say that we have reached a certain goal and that's the only fact that matters for legitimacy. You could start giving other reasons such as we have responded uh, to the need of the most vulnerable community, if most vulnerable members of our, of our community. We have made a decision that is uh, genuinely participatory. Th there can be different ways of justifying decisions. And I think I would really love it if Social Value UK reflected that a little bit more in the, in the sessions that they run for charities in the UK. I mean, I think this is such an important question in some ways that's kind of what everything else is question about trade offs and prioritization is kind of the central question really because obviously if there were no trade offs, then you could have everything and we wouldn't even we'd just be going out there and enjoying it and not sitting here talking about it. Um, I mean, I think for me that the kind of the issue here about progress is that we aren't very well equipped to think about trade offs because we don't really have a very good information from people about about their priorities and really what they care about the most. We don't have the, the sort of weights essentially that people attach to different dimensions of progress. And I think for me, this is part of a, a kind of broader point about all of our measures and the way that we tend to think. I mean, I think this is particularly something which is particularly acute in the development sector where I've spent most of my career, but we, we don't spend nearly enough time just simply asking people what they want in in different ways which are which then elicit the kind of information that can be used to judge what are the priorities if people want 10 things what do they want most and what are the biggest priorities and what are the trade-offs and i think there are models to draw from this I and mean, i think there's I'm, i've always been really interested in the different the models that have been developed in the health sector for um for you know the whole sort of huge amount of academic um, effort that went into developing the quality and thinking about which is entirely built around the idea of trade-offs between different dimensions of health and how you rank different health states that are based around sort of different trade-offs and I think you know potentially there's a lot that could be learned there not necessarily read directly from it about thinking about public policy not in terms of binary yes no to different indicators but in terms of comp you know sort of composite indicators that are weighted because until you know the weights how can you possibly judge the trade-offs and until you ask people how can you know the weights mm. so we'll try and get into some of these other questions um bina can i come to you what should the public employee do uh differently tomorrow now that they've watched our session well um never having been one i can only give you a guess um, so, um, it, taking off from, I think, a, a degree of consensus that, that we need to talk to people and ask them what their priorities are. My additional um, input into that would be, how do you make sure that the people who are silent, who are invisible, who are behind the door, who don't come to meetings, how do you get their views? How do you solicit those? Um, and, and I've been to a lot of civil society meetings in villages across India and Nepal and so on. And some, so I'll give you an, just a little example, um, which is that um, it is very difficult to get women to come to these meetings because it was not seen as in a, in a very male space, but they came, but they wouldn't speak. And the decision had to be made who will visit, which group of people will be represented to, to, an, to another state um, uh, on, on a learning cross-learning program. Uh, and uh, the men said, uh, well, X, Y, Z. And the NGO person said, and what do the women think? There were only five women. I was sitting in a corner watching. And um, the women looked at each other and they said something. It wasn't heard except by the NGO. 10 minutes later, he asked again, but I think this is what the women said. 
So in the end, what you got was what they said actually came up on top, not because they spoke loudest, but because the person uh, doing the meeting actually brought their voices up. So that's, that's one part of it. But I think from my own research, I can say that when you have a critical mass of a disadvantaged group, then they're more likely to have voice and be able to say what they want and, and uh, carry it forward. Now, where does the crit this word critical mass has come in hundreds of times, you know, uh, in, in parliament, reservation for seats for women and so on. Um, and uh, nobody tested it, I found when I was doing my research. So I tested it. I said, what is this one third magic fi figure? Surely, I mean, it could be 15, it could be anything. And I did find in my own research that 25 to 30, 33% mattered. Now, I'm not saying this is a magic figure, but the idea that there is to have a critical mass present in and of itself, the power of numbers mm -hmm. seems to make a difference. Um, and just one little insight that if you talk to village women and I talked to a group and they said, you know, if a thousand of us turn up at a meeting, we don't have to say we are strong. They just know we are. So. <laughs> I like that thought very much. The growth um, question is for you, Matthew. You have to answer it. Um, ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's far more difficult. I, I suppose um, not too different from uh, Josh's answer this morning. Uh, I would say that whenever it comes to questions of growth and progress, we have to jump in and start thinking about growth of what? And if we're thinking about growth of GDP, growth of pure market outcomes or economic outcomes, then we have lost the plot and we're having a discussion that was relevant only 70 years ago. Um, if we're talking about growth in the capacity of a society to generate prosperity, both today and long into the future, then I think we're having a much more interesting discussion. And that capacity has to, by definition, build in a concern for nature, because if we don't include and incorporate and protect our environmental capacity to support well-being into the future, none of the other assets at our disposal matter. Uh, that's my answer on that one. Um, but it shouldn't be me answering. Um, mm -hmm. could, could I come to questions from either the center or the right half of the room? <laughs> uh, yes, we have a, a woman in a blue shirt. Hello, thank you. Am I heard? Okay. So I'm Mona Zogby um, from CISL, Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. And um, for me, I think it's quite uh, appealing having an all-female panel. I think that's, uh, so cheers for the organizers for that. I think that brings a, um, quite a different <laughs> appeal. Um, and especially with regards to some of the key themes that emerged, whether um, on well-being, on the power dynamics of data, or on uh, gender inequality. But it also, for me, begs the question or makes me wonder on um, whether there is a distinct gender lens that comes with interpreting well, um, progress, with making meaning of, of how we make meaning or measure progress. So whether there is a gender differentiation on that. Uh, and so given the interface of personal and professional worldviews. Uh, and so maybe to make it brief, I'd, the key question for me would be, I'm wondering, had this been an all male panel, do you think that the conversation would have been very different or not necessarily? Thank you. Oh, that's a good question. I like that. Um, just behind you, there was uh, a question as well. I thought that was you. Thank you. Uh, Ambika Hirnandani, I'm doing the Masters of uh, Public Policy. Um, so within our audience, there are some of us who are sort of advocates for different ideas and sustainability. I personally work on sustainable technology. I was an environmental lawyer and I switched over to this. When I sit in meetings with bureaucrats or when I'm appearing in court, we often get asked, what about the human cost of a sustainable technology? Say for example, now I'm working with cultivated meat. Farmers will lose livelihoods, but yet it's such a great technology. It's something that can reduce GHG emissions. It can help food insecure countries. It can help uh, bridge nutrition gaps. Can you, because we have such an amazing panel, I'd love to know what should I do when I'm sitting in a room and a bureaucrat fires this question at me? How do I answer it? <laughs> All right. I may as well, 
I may as well get some advice as I go into the <laughs> next thing. Uh, and, and for our final in this, that we had one a gentleman uh, towards the front. Uh, uh, oh, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Graham. I was a senior civil servant at the Department for Transport. Um, and I'd like to ask the panel what they think about the fact that if you ask people what would represent progress in their lives, you might not always like the answer that you get. For example, if you ask young people in the global south what sort of future transport would they like, they will tell you, I'd like to own and drive a car like the rich folks in the north. And if you rewind 50 years in this country, there were very few women who drove or owned a car. Now the rates are broadly similar between men and women. Does that constitute progress um, or, or, or is that somewhat ambiguous? Okay, so we, we've got three excellent, difficult questions. Um, a gender lens on progress, um, the human cost of sustainable technologies, uh, and what happens when people's definitions of progress are stubbornly unhelpful. <laughs> um, go ahead, yeah. Um, I think I've what great questions. I don't know. I'd love to speculate on what might have, we might have said differently had we had this been an all uh, uh, an all male panel. I mean, I think we have <laughs> talked about gender. I guess what the way I would like to see that question being answered is the point at which we get to all male panels talking about gender. Then we'll know <laughs> we're winning. I think so. <laughs> it's slightly reversed. <laughs> um, I think in terms of the the point about the costs of transition. Uh, I mean, I think the point about actually the similarities, I think, in those last two questions about the cost of transition and what if you ask people what they want and you don't like the answer. <laughs> I think, you know, both are about the kind of really difficult, the unpalatable political decisions that people need to take. I think, you know, there are going to be costs of transition. There always are. You know, we don't have a sort of horse and cart industry in this country anymore. Some people probably went out of business. You know, I think... I, I don't know, I feel quite hard line about this. I feel <laughs> kind of, yes, there are going to be costs of transition. That is no reason not to progress. However you define progress, the point that we should be thinking about there is how you enable people to cope with those transitions, not whether they happen at all. But it seems to me there is a question there, but I don't think it's the question about whether you have the transition. The question is, how do you help people to manage it? Um, and that is, I think, the question that our politics should be answering. And, you know, unfortunately, I missed the leveling up session this morning, but, you know, that's kind of implicit in the leveling up agenda, really, is we're still dealing with some of the costs of previous transitions. Um, and then just quickly on what if you ask people, you know, what they want and you don't like the answer. We actually had this. One of the um, one of the things that I did in the run up with, with the UN in the run up to the um, to the sustainable development goals was run with the with the UN development program, a big global survey called My World, where we got 10 million people around the world. That's one in every 700 people answered one question. Um, and it was, you know, most of the responses came from sort of hundreds of grassroots organizations. So it was all, you know, pen and paper out in communities um, answering this one question about what were the priorities for you and your family. And the reason we did that was so that people's voices could be taken directly into the negotiating rooms of where they were negotiating the sustainable development goals and the people who were those politicians could kind of hear that answer and be informed by those priorities. The really concerning thing that the things that were at the top of the list are totally unsurprising, really important health, education, jobs. The thing that was concerning about that was how low the climate was as a priority. And of course, that was a you know, that was an example of asking people, lots of people, what their priorities were and really, you know, it was even quite a worrying answer. And, you know, you see that now also in some of the politics around low traffic neighbourhoods and all those kind of things. I still think it's better to ask. It's better that politicians have that information because then that can guide communications, it can guide how policy is implemented, it can guide the incentives that you provide. It's still, even if, I think the question is, <coughs> If you ask people what they want, that doesn't necessarily mean that public policy just simply becomes a kind of mechanistic exercise of tick, 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 they want this, so we'll do X, Y, Z, because then there'd be no politics. It's still about the trade-offs and the complexities, but it's better to do that in, with the information, I would say. Okay, um, and so you know this issue about technology uh, and, uh, uh, and exclusion um, is, is a very old question. 
And um, one way to, uh, to think about it, uh, in my view, is that um, uh, issues of property and ownership and institutions could be brought in. So you have a technology, and then we imagine that one person is going to own it and is displace all these farmers. But what if the group of farmers actually owned it? So you have a much more group approach to ownership of assets. It's a very old idea, but I think it needs to be revived, you know, rethought through. Um, and, and if they did that, then they could all gain by the gains of that uh, particular technology. Um, so we need to redefine and stop constantly thinking about, um, about ownership in terms of uh, individual property. And uh, it's something in between, uh, Matthew, between uh, a commons mm. and individual private is, is the in-between. It's something I've been working on in a very different context, which is groups of farmers coming together um, to actually access technology, which they wouldn't be able to do individually. Does that make sense? Um, make a quick question, a quick comment on the cars issue. So, so I would say um, that if women and men are both driving cars, that's progress, there's less inequality. But the fact that they're driving cars may be a problem for the future for sustainability. So, so I think I would go in the direction of public transport. And if it's, um, you know, in London, you get on, hop onto a train or a you know, tube or a, or a bus, uh, we're very well endowed, and then it's fairly egalitarian. So yes. for me, of course, that this, would be progress. This varies across different parts of the world. And it's it varies across different parts, of the, parts of the world. For women so we need to lobby bus. much more for full access for, for everybody to and move away from cars, if you like. <laughs> Anna, did you want to come in on this? I would love to. Uh, I'll start on the last question. Um, it is really important not to think of progress as an aggregation of individual preferences and to think uh, the, the relevant preference is not of what you'd like as an individual. The relevant preference is what you'd like as a citizen, as a member of a community. And it may be naive, but I do think that people's preferences as members of community can be very, very different and a lot less selfish than their preferences as individuals. Uh, so, so that's that's one answer. You have to get, but but then you have to figure out how to get people to talk about their members, about their preferences qua citizens, and uh, I. So, so that's my worry about surveys. It doesn't come out in surveys uh, that that sort of preference. It comes out in a joint conversation where you are speaking amongst your your equals, and uh, and about gender. Uh, thank you for raising it. Um, the feminist thinking has transformed um, uh, ideas about methodology of uh, uh, qualitative and quantitative research. Feminist has, thinking has uh, transformed uh, our definitions of what counts as labor and what counts as good. So I, I guess I would, I would like to think that the things you've heard about today, about progress, had already incorporated all of that. And, and, and I also, again, might be naive, but I think has also become a consensus that, you know, any kind of good thinking about progress has to be sensitive to both qualitative and quantitative evidence and has to be uh, ethically aware. Um, I, 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 I hope that, you know, feminism has already uh, done the job and at this point, uh, male colleagues would recognize things we say as not particularly controversial. You've never been controversial. <laughs> um, I will turn now to some questions from our online audience uh, who joined us from all around the world. Uh, and one of the questions that I think is particularly poignant comes from Richard. Um, and he's asking us to comment a bit about on whether the extent to which our understanding of progress incorporates a concern for fragility or resilience. Um, and how do we understand progress in a world in which we see looming existential risks coming down the pipeline? Hmm. I mean, I think, first of all, I think there's two things here, I would say. First of all, I think we're all we've become as if we needed reminding, but extremely aware in the last few years that, you know, progress can go down as well as up and that, you know, progress kind of, I think we perhaps you know, there are some lucky periods in history where we've been able to become a bit complacent about progress and think things will always just continue to get, get, get to get better. 
And I suppose we've been reminded over the last few years that that is not always true for the world as a whole and certainly not for individuals within it. And I think just coming back to this point about priorities and asking people what they want, one of the bits of research that I did quite early in my career that really helped sort of shape my thinking about this was when I was working for, um, for Christian Aid, which is one of the sort of international development agencies, and we were working on trade policy and trying to understand sort of how farmers were experiencing the impacts of international trade. And of course, all of the sort of global public policy debates at the time were all based around the impact of changing trade rules on prices and what might happen to prices in global markets um, if, if, uh, if rules were changed. Um, but what was so interesting when we went and asked farmers about this, and this was specifically in Ghana, I don't know if the results would be um, would still would be true in other countries, was the extent to which, of course, they're interested in the price they were getting. No, of course they were. But how they were also have one another very important thing in forming their calculations about what to plant, what to market, how to run their farming business, essentially, was about avoiding risk mm. and was about at a sort of personal level saying, what can I do that will you know, help me to get a good price in the short term, but also that will help me to to minimise my vulnerability to you know and my my exposure to risks in the in the longer term. And that was really important to me in the set the sort of learning for me in terms of the way that individuals also were thinking about those questions of risk and vulnerability as part of their definition of the kind of good life for themselves. So I'm I'm going to jump in now because uh, I'm the chair and I can and we have four minutes left. Um, and there's one final question that I wanted to ask uh, of, of this panel, um, and we need to be brief with the answers. Uh, this has been an excellent and enlightening discussion. But imagine you were back here in 50 years for the 2072 Bennett Institute annual <laughs> conference, and we had another session on what progress means and how we can measure it. How would you want that? What, how do you think that discussion would be different and how would you want it to be different? Thank you, Matthew. Um, something that I already said, I hope that we, I hope that participatory approaches to uh, progress become routine and normal. And I hope that they get past the idea that in, to make people heard, you just need to administer a survey to people. That's not good enough. There has to be a proper conversation. And therefore, I hope that, that we get to a better integration of different styles of expertise. Um, so I, uh, firstly, I want to throw a little spanner in the works on this issue of preferences. Because I think in one line that there are adaptive preferences and people don't always feel empowered enough to state what they want. Um, but that's a whole different conversation, but uh, it's not easy to get at people's real preferences. Um, on what is likely and what one would like is of course two different things. Um, and what is likely um, is that we'll move away uh, from the more objective indicators, hunger, poverty, hopefully in 50 years, and um, likely move towards more subjective indicators um, uh, of well-being. So that's one shift I expect to take place. Uh, the um, other is that some kinds of issues will persist. Uh, inequalities could be relative inequalities, if not absolute. Um, and issues of natural capital and climate change, uh, I don't expect to fully go away. What I would like, of course, is that most of these indicators that we're measuring uh, yeah, they make enough progress that they're consigned to history. Uh, um, I'd like fewer indicators to monitor, much more data to be able to monitor them. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like much more self-monitoring by people and communities than by the state. So you want to put us out of a job? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, I want all of those things, but I think for me, kind of zooming right out on this issue for a minute, I think, you know, the central question for progress now is whether we can manage and we're not managing it so far in our public policy to reconcile the challenge of human progress with the, the with the resource constraints within which we live and I kind of think unless we this is slightly changing the topic a bit but unless we sort that out I'm not sure we're going to be talking about progress we might just be talking about survival. Oh, uh, 
Um, Sorry, that's, that a bit, that's a bit of a gloomy <laughs> note to end on. <laughs> on, on that but I'm note, sure we will. It'll all be fine. Uh, uh, it, is, be here. it is for us now to thank the panellists. Um, <laughs>